Okay. All right. Here we go. Notice of the April 8, 2020 meeting of the Real Estate Commission includes date, time, and location has been noticed on the Tennessee Real Estate website since October 30, 2019. Additionally, this month's agenda has been posted on the website since Friday, April 3rd, 2020. All right, thank you. We call the roll. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley. Here. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Here. Yes. Vice Chair Marsha Frank. Here. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Here. Commissioner John Moffitt. Here. Commissioner Stacey Torbett. Here. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Here. Chairman John Grease. Here. Okay. All right. We've got a quorum. Uh, Bobby, would you lead us in a prayer and to the pledge? Sure. Let's do the prayer first. How about that? Perfect. Okay. Almost gracious Heavenly Father, we just come to you just uh, thankful for the opportunity to be here today. But more importantly, we would uh, ask you and, and ask your uh, guidance over, over our country and, and, and over what's going on in the entire world right now. And just ask you to, we just know that your, your hand is guiding everything. And uh, we just ask you for our patience as, uh, as, as we kind of deal through this. Uh, uh, unknown sea that we're dealing with right now. We just ask your guidance over today's uh, meetings and blessings, and just just uh, just ask for your healing hand for those people that are dealing with the with with sicknesses right now. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So how we do this pledge, John? I think we stand up and say it with you. Okay, brother. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God invisible, with liberty, and justice for all. Thank you, Bob. And please pay attention to it. One thing you'll notice, it's going to call for a roll call vote each time we vote. So that's you've got to be paying attention. All right, Ms. Matlock. Okay. This is a telephonic scheduled meeting of the Tennessee Real Estate Commission. Notice of this meeting was posted to the Commission's website on Friday, April 3rd, 2020. As there is not a fiscal present, fiscal quorum present, a statement of necessity will be read into the record and filed with the Tennessee Secretary of State as required by statute. Pursuant to Tennessee Code Annotated Section 8-44-108B2, which states if a fiscal quorum is not present at the location of a meeting of a governing body, then in order for a quorum of meetings to participate by electronic or other means of communication, the governing body must make a determination that a necessity exists. That determination must include a recitation of the facts and circumstances on which it is based. Further, Tennessee Code Annotated Section 8-44-108A3 defines necessity as matters to be considered by the governing body at the meeting require timely action by the body, that physical presence by a quorum of members is not practical within the period of time requiring action, and that the participation by a quorum of the members by electronic or other means of communication <clears throat> is necessary. As stated, this is a previously scheduled meeting of the Tennessee Real Estate Commission that is now being held telephonically. The purpose of this meeting with members attending my teleconference is to conduct regular business of the commission, including but not limited to informal appearances, the education report, edu executive director's report, and complaints. Furthermore, it is necessary for this meeting to be held by teleconference in accordance with executive order number 16, issued by Governor Bill Lee on March 20th, 22, 2020, to ensure government continues to function open and transparently during COVID-19 emergency while taking appropriate measures to call to protect the health and safety of citizens and government officials. 
voting will be conducted by roll call. Thank you, Anna. Is there is there a motion to adopt or accept that statement of necessity? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Franks. Is there a second? Second. And, and when you guys, when you and ladies, when you make a motion or a second, if you identify yourself, just because I'm having a hard time picking up exactly who, especially on the mail. So who made that second? John. Uh, Steve Gwen Beach is John. So we have, we have okay. a motion and a second to accept the statement of necessity. Discussion? I hear none. Uh, Caitlin, would you call the roll, please? If you're in favor of the motion, vote aye. If you're opposed, vote no. Yes. Commissioner Beckley? Uh. Commissioner Jeff Diaz? Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks? Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn? Aye. Commissioner John Moffat? Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett? Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood? Okay, I think Bobby might have been, he might have lost connection. Um, Chairman John Grease? Aye. Okay, so, you have seven eyes. That motion passes unanimously with um, Bobby Wood absent. Bobby, you're not back. Yeah. All right, that's good. Anna, can we move forward with the meeting now? Yes. Okay, next up is to approve today's agenda. It was presented to you as a motion. Move to approve by Marsha. Thank you. Second Is there a second? Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Discussion. I, I have two items I want to just mention. First of all, I believe Toby Compton is on the line. Toby, are you on now? Hey, John. I sure am. Well, Thank you. Stand, stand by for a minute, Toby. So I'd like to um, get Toby on right after we approve the agenda. And then secondly, We've got this discussion of classroom courses, and several interested parties are currently watching this. And so I think it might be to everybody's benefit to move that up following Toby's comment. Is there any objection to that? No. Any objections? I don't know. And so I'd like for the agenda to be approved, adding Toby next in line followed by the classroom course discussion. Okay, again, we're going to have to call the roll. So if you're in favor of the motion, you'll vote aye. If you're opposed, vote aye. Okay. okay. Commissioner Joe Begley? Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz? Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks? Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn? Aye. Commissioner John Moffat? Aye. Commissioner Stacey Torbett? Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood? <clears throat> Chairman John Grease? Aye. All right, the agenda is adopted with those, with those amendments. All right, Toby. Welcome. Hey, uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. And, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, you know, these are strange times we're living in. Certainly, there are a lot of challenges in front of us uh, globally. Uh, oh, would, you, would you introduce yourself and your position with the state? We have a lot of good, good, good point. Uh, so, I'm Toby Compton. I'm the Assistant Commissioner uh, for the Department of Commerce and Insurance. Um, specifically, I'm over the regulatory boards. Uh, which track is administratively attached to. Um, but as I was saying, you know, there's a lot of challenging times in front of us. Uh, thank you for your patience and your flexibility this morning. Uh, this is one of the larger WebEx uh, 
that we that we've done so far. So um, thank you. I know there's uh, some challenges with uh, getting used to this new online environment, but that's just what we have to do right now. Uh, we've had a few board meetings, um, and they've all been successful. I'm sure this will be too. Um, but just a couple of quick things, just a, a, you know observations from the department. Um, we continue to work very closely with the governor's office, provide feedback and uh, details regarding the executive orders, um, not only for for track but also just across uh, all the regulatory boards. Um, they're all very very different in many respects, uh, yet the same in others. And so we're trying to find ways to be efficient, and continue the work. Um, I'm really really happy with Kate and her team. They've done a great job keeping up. Um, the metrics um, related to the uh, Real Estate Commission uh, have been very consistent. Um, you know, even when I look at the metrics going back four to six weeks before this uh, pandemic and situation happened, uh, our metrics are holding up very well. So I uh, for them, and I know that they one of them are going to be very close to the plan, the legal team, and uh, I really appreciate that uh, as well. Um, we continue to look at all the scenarios. Um, um, you know, but where where exactly are we in this particular situation? Um, we we've, we've got a number of scenarios in case things get worse. We work on scenarios coming out of this situation. Um, the commissioner has been very involved and very engaged. Uh, you guys are welcome to go look at uh, the department website uh, to see our, our updates. Um, they, the comms team has done a great job of updating and giving guidance based on uh, the governor's executive orders, EDC guidelines, and what. Um, what guidance we get out of um, out of Washington? Um, uh, the only other kind of comment I would have is, you know, uh, on the online courses, you know, the department's very interested in that. We're very much in favor of that. The governor is very much in favor of that. That's true for track. That's true for all of, um, of our different boards and commissions and programs. Um, we just think that if uh, that's a user friendly thing to do, it's the right thing to do. Um, in the you know at this point in the uh, Certainly, with the situation we have at hand, but this isn't a push that we've had now for about a year. Uh, and so, I would um, highly encourage the commissioners to um, to adopt online courses. Of course, we want quality online courses, not just any old online courses. We want quality, quality, quality. So, um, I know lots and eight hundred people will pay close attention and make sure that we uh, we choose, pick and choose the right online providers. Um, I'm happy to take any questions without any details. I'm happy to uh, give any feedback, uh, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Toby, I hear nothing. Good. I appreciate you coming online today with us and wish you the best work as well. I know your plate's full too. It's, it's been a very busy time. I've done a lot of these video conferences for sure. Uh, but I'm glad to be with you. I'll stay on the line, just muted. If anybody has a question or a concern, I'll I'll be happy to take it, or we can or we can get offline and talk if we need to. Y'all be careful, be safe, and I hope your families are well this Easter weekend. Thanks, Toby. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up uh, is the discussion um, of classroom courses <clears throat> being taught remotely, for lack of a better term. We all have received several letters or copies of letters from different executive officers across the state making this request. You've heard the governor's position. He's in favor of this you know, with certain conditions and parameters. And so, um, Adeline, do you want to start the conversation and let commissioners join in at that point? Or Ross, maybe we'll talk about it. Either Ross or I, um, we have both received uh, a good amount of outreach on um, different providers requesting to offer their classroom courses online during this time. Yes. So it's something that we would like the commission to consider. Um, we took a look at what other states are offering and put together some sample language that we think uh, would hopefully cover any questions that the commission may have um, and would also not be limiting to the providers. Um, I know I offered a slew of different streaming services on there um, to make it 
available for everyone. Um, I did receive one question um, about also asking, there was a couple questions that we were going to ask to have providers send to us if they wanted to use this option. Um, and somebody reached out to me about potentially also asking who the instructor of the course was going to be. Um, so that's something that we might consider asking in the questions to be submitted to Ross. Um, but we looked at our surrounding states and what they were doing, and that's how we, uh, and, and also listening to the feedback we had received from providers and came up with the sample language. I'd like to be heard on that. Can you hear me, commissioners? Yes. And always. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, yeah, Caitlin uh, said it well. You know, we've had about, I don't know, between 30 and 40 different uh, providers request this um, streaming or uh, uh, Zoom or however they want to use uh, using a format that would be uh, uh, in person and um you know and real time so so we've got a lot since that it's very strange but since the last meeting of course you know with the pandemic being proclaimed right after that well we just got a slew of them um most all of the larger associations in the state have, have asked the same so uh caitlin's put together uh, i think it's on your uh your ipads there your agenda but it's just a small um, uh, explanation of instructions for them to uh, the two main things uh, that they should follow would be that uh, that in-person uh, discussion that uh, they could when they teach the class and and, and this is going to be for let me back up this is going to be for existing classrooms uh, classroom courses so during the period of time uh, that, that the commission decides to approve it until May the 18th, uh, then these, uh, these folks who want to teach the, the classroom courses will send this, um, this instruction back to me requesting that, that that's what they want to do. Um, but the, the two things that are important is that they have that, uh, uh real time discussion capability that they can talk just like they were in a classroom, and that they have a proctor uh, to be able to assure us that that they stay in their seats for the duration of the classroom. So th that's kind of it in a nutshell. And if the commission proceeds, then I think it'd be a, a great idea and a boon to the industry and real estate education. Commissioners? Mr. Chairman, this is Marsha. Um, I particularly like the uh, list of um, uh, requirements made by the uh, Memphis Association of Realtors. Um, it was um, a, a good um, list of things that needed to be done uh, to ensure that people are sitting in their seats um, and that it all goes well. Um, I would love for us to be able to incorporate those requirements into this um, into this uh, language that Caitlin has provided us with, and and I'm wondering if that is possible, and I, that may be an Anna question. So, so, so Bobby, go ahead. Um, so how is that different than what was given to us in the first place? M Memphis is asking for. Uh, well, there's more things on the list. Have you got the list? Uh, I've read that letter about Memphis, but I didn't print it out. I've got the list that was on the original, uh, I guess, proposal or something come from our, from I think, Trek. I think Bobby, that it just gives more direction as to what should, what should be done. Uh, like they have to log in before the class. They have to be visible on the camera at all times. Uh, they cannot take phone calls. Um, they cannot participate uh, in computer-based work while attending the class. Students may not step away. Uh, they're, re they're responsible for uh, their own technology. And... Um, 
Uh, no sharing a room with other students unless they have permission. I just think it gives uh, it gives them more advice on how to run it and what we would be expecting. So, uh, okay, Ross, did did you look yes. at that this letter? I thought it was pretty comprehensive as well. It, it is. It's one of the more comprehensive ones we we have. I think that uh, uh, there was a. And Marsh, you may recall this too, but it went out over Arillo, the listserv for all the Arillo participants. But the Nebraska, um, the Nebraska Commission had a pretty good detailed version of that. It was user friendly. Um, I, I think that we need to give them as much direction as we can, but we also need to be, um, just my opinion, that, that it needs to be user friendly, that they can uh you know kind of jump into doing these things once they get me once they send to us uh, their request to do so um and then you know follow that um but but they're all kind of hurting out there i'd have to say um and they're wanting this so whatever the commission decides i certainly you know go for that and i am certainly for this um and it I'd like for us not today, but in future conversations, discuss it uh, overall um, for our future. Um, but I, I see nothing wrong with giving them this uh, list of things as direction of how it's to be taken care of. Otherwise, um, I just see a lot of problems happening if we don't have rules. So, uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman, Steve. Steve Gwynn, I've got a, a question or two uh, on the list from Memphis. I think it's a good one, and certainly we want to uh, try to do whatever we can to have online classes. How are they going to, or how is the the teacher or whoever is doing the uh, course going to monitor whether this stuff is actually happening or not? Is it just the honor system, or what? Or do we know? Well, you know, this is wrong. Uh, go ahead, Kayla. Well, I was going to say, uh, I think what we've seen is the requirement of having a proctor yes. in the class or in the meeting that their main role is checking on the student participation. Uh, that wouldn't be the role of the instructor. It would be the role of the proctor. So they would watch the screen while they're teaching the class to make sure people are sitting down and all that kind of, all those kind of things. Right. But only, yeah, I think if we, but only if we tell them to, I mean, if there's no rules for the proctor, the proctor needs this guidance, I think, from the Memphis Association. Hey, Caitlin, where is this Memphis letter? Because I can't find it. So the Memphis, um, I sent it out on Monday or Tuesday, um, and it was a grouping of, uh, four or five letters that had been sent to Ross and I to distribute to the commission. So it would have gone out, uh, I believe it was on. Okay, I see it. It looks like it's uh, four, you know, four, six. To the rest of the, okay. <laughs> yes, I found it. Thank you. And, and I'm not trying to make this hard on anyone. I just, I think this gives them direction that they need uh, so they know what their job is. Are any of the commissioners opposed to it? Hey, Marsha, I, I, just one thing. Yes. If it's possible, I would think it should be pretty But if any provider offers this service, I think it would be great if they could provide a link to Ross so he could he could step in and watch the class occasionally. He wouldn't have to travel. It's one of those things we've talked about for a long time, you know, actually looking at how the classes are going. So good. is that is that possible, Ross? Can we just add a link so you can you can step into a class and make sure it's going on and listen to the content for a little bit? I would think we could do that. I'm not the IT guy, but I would assume that that's possible. Well, here's what I think. If they, if they invite every student, they ought to be able to invite you too. 
Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I, yeah, they should provide me a link um, as well when they uh, when they execute that uh, document requesting it, they be allowed to do this for the existing courses. And also, just a word, but the instructors, uh, they're not going to have to have their CDEI here. They're just the instructor for the basic classroom course that the commission is allowing them to uh, proceed with their uh, in-person uh, Zoom format. Hey, John. Hey, Bobby. My thought is, I'm good with this. Let's. I mean, we got to release. Now. I'm, I'm good with doing what the Memphis uh, does, and as long as they just provide a link, uh, I guess the avenue in order that Ross, if he wants to, to step into the meeting and say it, and then I'm fine with this. I mean, because what we're doing. This is a, I mean, in effect, it could be just a one month thing. Now, because if I, if I'm reading this right, but we're just gonna get some these real estate schools and also the real estate and stuff right now. So, can that be a motion? Yeah, you can certainly be an emotion. I'd like for it to be a motion. We do this and, and use the Memphis proposal just to understand that they also do this. Uh, Ross, uh, ability to get into the class he wants to. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. second. Steve. Steve. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So, um, Adeland, one question for you. So, so, your proposal had an ending date, correct? It, um, we had sort 18. of tried to make it concurrent with the executive order related to licensing. That way, if that order got extended, it would also extend this. So, Bobby, I'm thinking we might ought to include that language in this so that there is a date certain. Yeah, no problem. Other so, comments, Jeff? Jeff, go ahead. Well, what I observed from the uh, online platforms is that they obviously have the ability to record and I would hope that there is some analytics that are also part of these platforms that will allow you to make to uh, preserve who attended and for how long. Uh, I think for the real estate associations and maybe even the providers, if we just ask them to maintain those records so that they can you know, be audited by the commission or by Ross at some point to, for CE credit, see if there's you know, in, in case there are any questions in the future about it. Okay. So, uh, this is Caitlin, just so I'm clear. Um, is everyone okay with keeping the sample language, but including all of the, um, guidelines that were proposed in the yes. MAR, uh, their, their guidelines for streaming? Yes, that's what we're talking about. Yes. That sounds good to me, Kayla. Um, this is Anna. I think it would be um, a good idea if we just have the dates coincide with the executive order, um, as we said beforehand. So at this time, the executive order, I think, is in place until April 14th. But, um, of course, if it's extended, then um, we will extend this as well. So, if uh, we have, sorry, go May ahead. 18th. I'm showing May 18th. May 18th. May 18th. Sorry, May 18th. Yes. So, but if that is extended at any point, um, we'll just have it coincide with that date. If that's okay right. with everyone else. Yeah, so we, don't we don't want to have to re-vote on it again. Yeah. Yeah. And it says, or unless otherwise notified, and that may mean, you know, does it have a little more language as far as from the um, uh, governor um, and his orders? Okay, sounds good to me. Uh, let me see if I can restate what I think of the motion. Uh, the motion offered by Bobby Woods and seconded by Steve would incorporate the Memphis Area Association of Realtors Educational Foundation Foundation Guidelines 
into the proposal presented to us by Ross and Caitlin with these additional factors that the authorization to do these live stream classes will end, let's put it this way, it will coincide with the governor's executive orders, that the provider will maintain the, rec the recordings of the class, and the provider will provide a link to Ross White so that he can step in and observe the class as well. That's what I think's in front of us. That's right. Is there discussion on that motion? If not, I sense we're ready to vote. Ms. Maxwell. Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. Aye. So I got seven, um, and Joe was not present for the vote. All right. Seven ayes, no negative votes, and one vacant absent, Joe Bagley. All right. Um, I know that members of the real estate community, especially, especially association executives online, um, best of luck. Thanks for stopping in to see us. And you can stay if you like. All right, next hey, item. Is this something, can, can Ross get this and get it up on the Trek website somehow as soon as possible? Or yes, I'm sure everybody will see this, these provisions. Yeah, that, uh, Caitlin and I were going to get that on the website. And we're also working with our um, uh, media uh, folks at the department to get out this uh, communication. The notice and the uh, also the letter and all to all providers. Okay. All right. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Next up, we're to approve last month's minutes. Is there a motion, motion to approve the minutes? This is Jeff. Okay. So Jeff, did you make the motion? Okay. Who seconded? Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, I, I mentioned this to Caitlin. She's going to check on it. But I have my recollection. You all may remember Mr. Willoughby last month who wanted to get his broker's license back. And the minutes reflect that he has the opportunity to get his affiliate broker's license back. But it seemed to me there was a vote before that, that there was a positive vote to allow him to have his broker's license, and that motion failed. Does anybody else remember that? Yes. Well, I think Caitlin was going to go back and check the minutes, but I'd like to get that added into the minutes if indeed that's what happened. Any objection to that? Yes, if not, let's vote on the minutes of last month. If you're in favor of those minutes, Caitlin will call your name and you can vote aye. Okay. Commissioner Joe Begley. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffat. Aye. Commissioner Stacey Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. But the, that, that motion passes on a seven eye, no vote, zero, no votes total. All right, next up, we have two informal appearances. Let me just check here. Is Brad Feliciano on the line? Uh, yes, sir. Is your broker there, too? I am. What is your name, sir? Ron Hodges with Stones River Property Management Real Estate Services. Thank you. 
All right, let me check also. Jerry Page, are you on the line? I am. Can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Is your broker on the line? I believe so. Greg, are you there? So, Jerry, you you just listen and take care of Brad first. And um, you'll see how the procedure goes, okay? And hopefully your broker will get online here. <clears throat> okay, uh, Brad and Ron, the first thing that's going to happen is Miss Matlock, our attorney, is going to ask you to to tell the truth. Following that, Ms. Maxwell, our executive director, will give us a brief summary of why you guys are at this meeting today. Once she is finished, we'll ask Brad to fill in any details that he would like, what caused him to be here in the first place, what he's done since then, what he's doing now, what he hopes to do, whatever he would like to tell us. Commissioners will reserve the right at that point to ask Brad questions. Following those questions, we'll ask uh, Ron Hodges to tell us why he would like to have uh, Mr. Feliciano with his firm. Ideas about training, supervising, whatever he'd like to tell us. And commissioners, again, will reserve the right to ask questions. And finally, at some point, someone will make a motion to either recommend that Brad Feliciano be allowed to continue to get his license or to deny the request. And we'll vote. It'll take a majority vote, whichever way it goes. So that's the situation. Miss Matlock, you want to get these guys sworn in? hear me now sorry yes that's good okay if you'll both raise your right hands um do you swear and affirm to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth yes i do yes yes thank you Thanks, Anna. okay caitlin what's up okay. before you you have applicant brad feliciano and his principal broker ron hodges the firm is stone Stones River Property Management and Real Estate, and a summary of the charges is removal of goods. Uh, the, Mr. Feliciano's statement and a letter of recommendation can be found uh, in the email that was sent to you. All right, Mr. Feliciano, um, we have some paperwork to reference, but why don't you tell in your own words? About three and a half years ago, uh, I made uh, a silly mistake um, and went into a store and left without paying uh, with a pair of headphones under $200. Uh, I went to court, paid my restitution, um, didn't have to take any classes. It was a misdemeanor fine. Uh, since then, I've, you know, I've held jobs. I've moved up in the company and then... Uh, I decided that I wanted to get into the real estate career, contacted Mr. Hodges, uh, moved from Arizona to Tennessee uh, in hopes of, to make this a lifelong career. Um, been working at Stones River as the office manager for the past since January, uh, and now we're here. All right, commissioners, questions for Mr. Feliciano? I have a couple. Um, Chairman, this is Marsha. Go right ahead. So, uh, uh, good morning, Mr. Feliciano. Um, so, uh, did I understand this correctly? That um, um, so you, you stole the headphones. Have you ever had any kind of problem? Um, um, have you ever done something like that before, or was it oh, just a okay? And so, excuse me. I was, I was sorry. I was. I'd never been in trouble before. That's the only time I've ever been in trouble. Okay. All right. So, did, did I understand that you moved from Arizona to Murfreesboro? The, the the crime committed was in Arizona, and you've since moved to Murfreesboro. Yes, ma'am. 
So that's a good indication to me that you're not around the same people that you were around when you were having uh, your drug problems. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. I cut off all communications with everyone starting starting fresh in Tennessee. Right. And is uh, are you related to Mr. Hodges, your principal broker? I am. My mother is married to his wife. Okay, so he's your uncle. Yes, ma'am. So, okay, all right. So that's another good thing for you. So you have this family bond and someone that has your interest that will um, uh, help you a lot. Right. Looking that's all. Me. That's the questions I have. Okay. Thank you, Marsha. Other questions? Did you say your mother was wife? They're no. twin sisters. Twin sisters. Yeah. <laughs> he did say that though. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, other commissioner so question. I don't know. All right, if I, not, I have, Mr. Hodges, oh. tell us. Okay, right ahead. I was just asking what kind of jobs and what kind of uh, responsibilities do you have as an office manager at a property management company? Can I answer that for him? Okay. You need to let him answer it. Okay. Yeah, so currently uh, I'm sending out leases. Uh, I'm renewing leases. Uh, I'm answering all the phones, transferring uh, to current agents, uh, especially during the COVID-19 situation. I'm at the office, um, you know, running the show when everyone else is home and transferring all calls to the right person, maintenance department. Uh, real estate agent to Ron himself, um, taking care of social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, um, you name it. I'm, you know, it's a one man show at the office currently with the coronavirus. Okay. Thank you. Well, and I'll add, he also uh, is, does all the uh, collection of funds, uh, post rents, that type of thing. Okay. Mr. Hodges, will you move that camera so we can see your face? Yes, here I am. <laughs> Thanks. All right, tell us uh, why you think Brad is a good candidate for your company well, and what, what you know about him. Well, obviously, I've known him all of his life. So, uh, you know, like all of us, he's uh, made a mistake and uh, has worked his way through it and out of it. He moved here to, to help me uh, uh, in this business and has done a remarkable job uh, as far as uh, getting in, learning, being uh, uh, enthusiastic, trustworthy. Like I said earlier, he not only does all the things he describes, but he's the first point of contact when people pay rent. So I've trusted him with... Uh, uh, money and 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 how that flows through the office uh, he uh wants to continue his growth and part of that would be uh, becoming an agent and being able to do you know what we do is more leasing uh uh and uh and then maybe he can you know after he learns that grow into to, to some sales along the way but uh uh you know he's done a phenomenal you know, he's made a big commitment to move here at his expense, and he's done uh, a great job, uh, you know, so far and had uh, absolutely no reason to uh, ever regret it. And I will say uh, to Commissioner Moffat, I think he actually knows uh, Mike and Pam, uh, his parents from uh, Holland, uh, Highland Cove at the lake. That uh, rings the bell. Yep. John Moffat knows a whole lot of people. <laughs> they were neighbors for a long time. <laughs> All right, commissioners, questions for Mr. Hodges. I'd like to make uh, a motion. John Moffat Agreed. want to make a motion. I'll make okay, the motion. Yes. Is your, is your motion to allow Mr. Feliciano to continue on yes. to get his license? Yes. Thank you. Yes. You're a second to that I, motion. I second that, Marcia. Thank you, Mr. Franks. So the motion on the floor 
which will handle by roll call vote is to allow Brad Luciano to continue on to get his uh, real estate license. If you're in favor of the motion, you'll vote yes or aye. If you're opposed, you'll vote no. Ms. Maxwell. Okay, back. Uh -huh. I'm going to Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Joe Beckley. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. Congratulations, Brad. You guys appreciate it. Good luck in your career. Thank you. Commissioners, thank you very much. Enjoyed the uh, first part of the meeting. We're going to jump off now, but uh, y'all stay safe. You too, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, right, Jerry Payne. Yes, sir. Her around. I am here. Can you hear me? I, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. You said I am here. Can you hear me? What is, what is your name? Craig Johnson. Okay, Frank. Craig. Craig. Did you hear? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. You need to get closer to your TV, Craig Johnson. All right. You, know, you want to square these two in? Yes. Okay, if you'll both raise your right hands, do you swear and affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Before you, you have applicant Jerry Page and his principal broker, Craig Johnson. Mr. Page has not yet taken the affiliate broker exam as of this write-up. The firm is Barnes RE Services, Inc., doing business as Caldwell Banker Barnes Franklin. An applicant... Uh, a summary of the criminal and disciplinary sanction is first degree fleeing or evading police. The statement and letter of recommendation can be found in the packet that was sent to you. Thank you, Caitlin. All right. Jerry Page, how about letting us know what happened? Yeah, wonderful. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. And then I think uh, the caveat um, to what I've completed, I've actually completed everything. I've completed my 60, 30 hours. I've passed my first time exam and um, I have my EO insurance and everything is in order. Um, and I've also went on the core website and pre done my work. So at this moment, I'm, I'm fully 100% complete. Um, what happened with this, um, hopefully you, uh, Oh, God. Jerry. He says low bandwidth on his picture. Okay. Hey, Craig Johnson. Yes, sir. You can hear me, right? I can. Jerry Page, can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right, Jerry, you got cut off for a second. If you'd if you'd start again, please. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Um. So where would you like me to start from the beginning? Yeah, we just got a few words before you went away. Okay. Um, so I actually. I, to start off, I actually have completed all the requirements to become a real estate agent. I've done the 30 hour, the 60 hour, I've got my EO insurance, 
I passed the, the, the real estate exam um, first time around um, and everything has been inputted into the core.gov website. So at this point, I am 100% done. Um, what happened with my incident was um, I, I was in the military for a number of years, two years out of those two deployments I did to Iraq. Um, and that affected me in a, in a way that um, basically had me diagnosed in PTSD and other areas and I was coping with alcohol. Um, and so that just uh, escalated how I was dealing with my problems. And that's what happened that within the first couple of weeks after I got out of the military, I was lost and I, I got these uh, charges in Paducah, Kentucky. Um, after which I stayed in jail two months. I got out, I did a year long uh, rehabilitation program through the VA up in Marion, Illinois. Um, it, intensive, I stayed there, I lived there for a year. My wife traveled to come see me. Um, that actually set me straight up. Uh, it, it was the best thing I ever did. Coming out of that, um, I finished my court case and did my probationary period for a year. Um, and that was probably around 2013 or 14. And since then, um, I've done nothing but I've worked for the VA. Um, I've kept up with my mental health appointments. I've got a bachelor in biology. I got an MBA from Bethel University as well. And I'm trying to grow in my career and kind of leave my past behind, but also be aware and mindful of what I have been through and how I keep myself healthy and safe. Um, and currently I accepted a position here next to the National Airport with the Air Force. So I'm the program manager for environmental um, biology and emergency response here um, for the Air Force National Guard. Um, but previously I started my career in the government at the Veteran Affairs and I've just consistently moved up. Started out as a GS-5, went to a GS-7, went to a GS-9, went to a GS-11. Um, and so hopefully you can see from the, the packets that I've supplied that um, I've only moved up from here. Okay. Commissioners. Oh, sorry, can I, can I add one? Sure. Sorry. Um, currently, right now, uh, a week ago, so all my charges that are listed in um, in Paducah. So prior to that, I have any? I, I've never had a charge, and then since this one charge incident, I've never been even a ticket. Um, and the charges right now are actually going through expungement through the court, and it takes three or four months. They said, but each one is. I have a certificate of eligibility that I can send to the group if need be, or I think I have that will allow that all my charges can be expunged. Thank you. Thank you. Marsha. Yes. Um, hello, Mr. Page. Um, I first want to thank you for your support to our country. Um, what is your MBA in? Uh, it, it's in um, uh, business administration. OK. Now, so this charge of fleeing or evading police, can you tell us what was that? What happened? What was the situation? So what happened was one morning I was drinking, coming off of, you know, coping with my my issues. And of course, I was most likely drunk. Um, and I and I I don't remember driving from Fort Campbell to Patuka, Kentucky, which is horrible to say. Um, but, you know, I have to be open and honest and, and candid. Um, so, yeah, so. Um, I think with that, along with possible flashbacks and dealing with, uh, you know, two tours in Iraq, um, I ended up using my vehicle maybe to kill myself um, at that time, um, and, which is probably not the right thing to do. Um, and so that's what happened is I got in my car and I drove down 40 to Kentucky and the police, you know, of course, it was at a high rate of speed. And then the police stopped me um, at that point. So that's the part about endangerment to the, the police that they were having to chase you at a high rate. Yes, ma'am. So the wanton endangerment, what that is, is because the police had to go at a high rate of speed and deploy their emergency um, like um, kits in their car, basically airbags. When they do that, it raises the charges from a misdemeanor to a felony. Okay. Okay, so um, that's all I have, uh, Chairman Green. Thank you, Marsha. Other other commissioners. Any other questions for Mr. Page? If not, uh, Craig Johnson, tell us what your interest sure, in having sure. Mr. Page. Uh, 
did with your company. Right, right. As I mentioned in my letter, I, I haven't known Jerry a long time. I mean, I just recently met him, but he comes highly recommended by one of our top agents who's known him for six or seven years now. And so I met I met with Jerry in the office, and we we probably talked for maybe 40, 45 minutes, got to know him then, was really impressed with him, and, and listened to his story. I do believe that that uh, he's made amends for what, what happened. He sought uh, he sought uh, medical attention, and he has not had any any problems since then. Um, I just believe that he deserves a a chance. I think he's going to make a fine real estate agent. Uh, he's very very smart guy, and and. Uh, course he will go through all of our training we we teach our agents what to do how to do and and keep them out of uh, trouble so uh, for that reason i think um, i think he should be allowed to uh, pursue his career in real estate thank you mr johnson are there questions for the broker like to make a motion please i'd like to make a motion that we accept uh, um jerry uh, page's application to um get his real estate license and i'll second this body thank you bobby so the motion on the floor is to allow mr page to get his real estate license made by miss frank seconded by mr wood discussion since you're ready to vote, Ms. Maxwell. Okay. Commissioner Joe Begley. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Vice Chair Marcia Frank. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. So, so the motion passes. Uh, good luck, Mr. Page, and I'll follow up with. Thank you for your service, and we look forward to your professionalism in this industry as well. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your positive vote. Congratulations, Thank Jerry. Thank you, Craig. All right, next item up is the Education Director's Report. Mr. White. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission, can you hear me? All right. Um, I want to present to the commission this morning the education agenda for April 8th, 2020. If you'd refer to that, um, I want to present to you that uh, I have reviewed and um, I, I believe all of these are comport with the law and the rules. I've reviewed all the courses, instructors, and providers. Number numbers A1 through A29, and I present them this morning for your approval. All right. Is there a motion to accept the education director's recommendation? And to approve this A1 Bobby, through A29. All right. Thank you, Bobby. Is there a second? This is Jeff. I second. Thank you, Jeff. So the motion on the floor made by Bobby and seconded by Jeff if passed, would approve courses A1 through A29. Would anybody like to pull a course out before we vote? All right, uh, no request. Let's vote. Ms. Maxwell. Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. 
Commissioner Steve Gwynn? Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt? Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett? Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood? Aye. Chairman John Grease? Aye. Mr. Chairman, I have a question of Mr. White. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, Mr. White, what I'm wondering is many of these um, classes were uh, their classroom classes. So I guess my question is, will this, they also fall underneath the, um, the motion that we had this morning about the new education guidelines as far as uh, doing them remotely or was that vote just for things before today? It, in my opinion, if you approve them, then their classroom format and they would fall with, within your approval of, of that uh, for that uh, in-person format this morning. So I think they would and fall within the parameters to go forward to at least May 18th if they submit their request to do so. Okay, that's what I was looking for. I just wanted to be sure that they were included. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh, Ross, how about the instructors? Uh, commissioners, again, uh, I call your attention to the instructor backgrounds form one and two. We have five new instructors this morning to present for your approval. Move to approve. I second. Thanks, Jeff. I have one question. Uh, Steve Gwynn. Yeah. So, so one of the classes is an IRM class at Memphis. Two instructors, one is John Snyder, who I know well. Um, you probably know him as well, don't you? Very well, yeah. What about Regina Mullins? I don't know her. Do you know her? Um. I have probably, let's see, not real well. I may have met her once or twice, but nothing comes to mind for off the bat. Okay. John Snyder uh, and our pretty good friend. I'm so su I'm surprised he would let anybody else speak. But... <laughs> You're right. <laughs> All right, we've got a motion on the floor to um, approve instructors as recommended by the education director. Let's vote. Ms. Cameron. Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Frank. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John. Here's Joe. Hello. <laughs> All right. In the, in the opinion of the chair, that motion passed on. I, did you vote on that, Joe? I did, but I was a little late. <laughs> I got you down. We've got you down as an I. 8 0, the motion passes. Right, next up is the executive director's report. Okay. Um, I don't have much for the commission. I did want to update everyone on sort of the status of the office. Uh, Assistant Commissioner Toby Compton mentioned this earlier, but we are, um, all staff is working, um, we're working from home at this time, but um, for purposes of the public, we are open for business, answering calls, emails. Um, we are not meeting with anybody in person right now, um, and the actual office is not open to the public. Um, PSI is currently closed until uh, May 1st. So 
we are not seeing any new testing um, and a handful of the fingerprinting sites are also closed. Um, there are a handful of locations still open. Um, so we are seeing quite a slowdown with new licensees coming in um, as well as sort of all applications in general. Um, but for all intents and purposes, we are working and available. But if anybody has any questions, I'm open to answer. Let's put this out there. Uh, I've, I've suggested to Caitlin that I'd like to get Commission's thoughts on this and maybe a motion that our May meeting, which is scheduled in Jackson, Tennessee, be rescheduled to a later date. And, and instead, at this moment, our May meeting would be a one-day meeting in Nashville, which would be a Thursday. And, and even that might be iffy, but we don't take a chance at losing hotel deposits, scheduling courthouses in Jackson that we may or may not be able to get into at that point. So. A different topic would be we're required by law to meet at least once a year in West Tennessee. And if we postpone the May meeting, then the question is, when will we do that? And so we can talk about that as well. So your thoughts on, on this issue. I agree that we need to um, uh, postpone going to um, uh, Jack's uh, for the meeting in West Tennessee. Um, and, um, you know, I'm open to any other month uh, to go. Um, I know we'll be going to East Tennessee in October, so we probably uh, need to do it sometime this summer. Um, and maybe um, look at months that might be uh, like 4th of July around that time is usually a hard time to have a meeting. Uh, but otherwise, I, th I think it's prudent that we do, do uh, change it um, to another month. And, and we can make the decision about when to reschedule in West Tennessee at our May meeting. I just want to have that, you know, do it if the commission would like. But let's, let's break it into two parts. Can we get a motion to um, postpone the Jackson? to a future date and instead I'm meet in. in Nashville in May. I'm in. This is Jeff, I second. Thank you, Jeff. So the motion is to um, postpone the May meeting in Jackson to a future date to be determined. That was made by Ms. Franks, seconded by Mr. Diaz. Discussion on that motion. Now, before you, let's vote on it. Those of that motion will vote aye when Caitlin calls your name. Okay, hey, Commissioner Joe Beckley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. Okay, now, as far as the May meeting goes, at this moment, it's going to be a one day meeting and it's scheduled, if we stick to the calendar we previously set up on a Thursday. And I'm trying to pull my calendar up and I can't get it up quickly enough to tell you what date that is. Is Thursday May still? Day. No, June. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. May 7th. Right. Thank you. So, Caitlin, just out, if you can help me with this, the governor's current executive order runs through what date? The, the executive order related to our licensing renewals runs until May 18th. 
So are we safe to schedule an in-person meeting May 7th, or can we, we can change that, I know, quickly, but. Um, so, this is Anna. Currently, the stay-at-home order, I think, is until April 24th. Um, so, technically, um, we would be able to meet in May, but of course, there's always a possibility that this can be rescheduled, can be extended. Um, so, if that happens, you know, we could just have another meeting by WebEx, but for now, we can just um, see if the room is available on that date to meet on the 7th in person. I think Caitlin's probably already reserved. Room. So we'll yeah, keep we'll keep, right. it, we'll keep it at May 7th right now, and we may have to be flexible, and we've proven we can do that. All right, other questions for Caitlin in her role as executive director? If I just, not, I just wanted to thank her, John, because they've got uh, they've done a really good job, and I was especially glad to hear Mr. Compton uh, praising um, um, Caitlin's uh, work and all the staff. So uh, I, I do appreciate them working in this unprecedented time. Great Thank point. you. Okay. Um, and is Chris in town today too? I am here. All right. So we're going to go to the consent agenda. Anna, you want to tell us how this is going to work out? Okay. Um, so in lieu of doing a consent agenda and a legal report, we have placed all items onto the consent agenda. And um, previously, we requested uh, by email for commissioners to let us know which complaints they would like to have pulled. Um, so what we'll do is um, Kristen and I will still have to read the numbers into the record, and then um, we'll talk about the individual cases that um, we got questions about. Did you want me to go ahead and tell you what cases those are? Let's do it. If you can tell me who asked to be pulled out, that'd be great. Okay. So I have, um, according to my records, cases 9, 10, 11, 12, um, 17, 25, 32, 33, 36, 38, 77, 80, 81, 83, and 84. So, tell me which one's Bobby pulled out. Let's start with that. <laughs> Would you would you tell me which ones Bobby pulled out, and then tell me which ones I pulled out? Commissioners, okay. um, so we only received emails from uh, Chairman Grease and from Commissioner Wood. Um, so, Chairman Grease, you had questions on 11, 12, 25, 33, 36, 38, 80, and 84. And um, you'll need to, when we vote, recuse yourself from 17, 77, and 81. Okay. Then everybody else, everything, everything else is Bobby's, right? Yes. And then all the okay. other questions. Uh, Commissioner Wood had questions on 9, 10, 12, 30, 31, 32, and 83. You said 17. Did you? Who? who? Okay, well, uh, that might be a mistake if no one had 17. 17 so was gone. a recusal. Sorry, okay. yeah. 17, 77, and 81 are recusals. Okay. 
So we're going to make the assumption, commissioners, that all the other cases are, are you're okay with staff or attorney's recommendation? Any, anybody want to dispute that at this point? If not, um, Kristen, do you want to start? Yes. And, and, I, and I don't think you need to read the ones we've asked me about. I don't guess you need to read them to the record at this point, unless you'd like to, just so you get them on the record and you don't have to read them later. Whatever you think. Um, I guess at this point, I will just go ahead and read everything that I have on the consent agenda, just the, the numbers, the complaint numbers, and then we'll just go back to the ones that have been pulled out like we normally do, if that works okay. for everybody. That's good. Okay, so um, I will start number one, 2019 -09 number two, 2019 -09 number three, 2019 -09 number four, 2019 -00051. Five twenty nineteen one zero zero one three one number six twenty nineteen one zero one six eight one number seven twenty nineteen one zero one eight two one number eight twenty nineteen one zero two one 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 number nine twenty twenty zero 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 two one number ten twenty twenty zero zero one six one number eleven twenty twenty zero 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 Number 12, 2020 Number 13, 2020 Number 14, 2020 Number 15, 2020 Number 16, 2020 17 2020 number 18 2020 number 19 2020 number 20 2020 21 2020 23 um, and I think that was one second. Yes, one through 29, um, my recommendation is for dismissal on all of those. Um, however, I would like to amend my recommendation for number 12 and take that to the legal report instead of the consent agenda. Okay, so here's kind of what I think, Kristen. You could continue reading your numbers in. It will, the motion will be to accept your recommendation. Whether it's to dismiss so just continue the ones that I recommended dismissal on as well. Just everything. We, we like your recommendation on every one of the ones we've pulled out, is my understanding. Okay, so I'll okay. start with 30 through um, the end of the report and give my recommendation on each one of those individually. 30 okay. Okay. Okay, so number 30, 2020 um, And you guys want me to do the recommendation as I read each one. Or should I just go through and read all of the, comp the numbers into the record and just say that I recommend discipline for all of those? Uh, I think if you-, if you, if you, if you I'm sorry, Anna. I was just saying, you can just read the numbers and say that you recommend discipline. That's okay. fine. You don't have to read each uh, recommendation. That would be great. Okay. So, uh, 2020 002821, number 31, 2019 number 32, 20005161. 33, 2019, 09, 6, 2, 4, 1. 34, 2019, 09, 8, 8, 3, 1. 
Um, and for all of those, oh, I'm sorry, and I have some reprints down here, but I will, well, first I'll just go with the 29 through 41, and I recommended a discipline on each of those, with the exception of 41, where I recommended a deferral to the next meeting. And then we have a few represents, number 42, 2019-08571. Um, number 43, 2019 08 um, Okay. So, for a motion to, to accept council's recommendation on cases 1 through 43, with the exception of cases 9, 10, 11, 12, 25, 30, 31, 32, 33, 36, and 38. These are such emotions. I think you left out 17, didn't you, John? Oh, yeah, I'm going to recuse myself. That's just a recusal on that one. Okay, okay. So Jeff makes a motion to accept, make that, makes that motion. Is there a second? Second. Who's that? Joe. Joe. Thanks, Joe. Okay, is everyone clear on the motion? We've got a, a dozen cases or so to go back and hear individually or just talk about for a second. Everyone ready to vote? All right, let's vote. Ms. Maxwell. Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marsha Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye, with the exception of who's on number 17. All right. Back to number nine. So, uh, with number nine, yeah. I believe that was Commissioner Woods. Yeah, I, when I, my email to you was really a question. It was on that third paragraph. It was saying that respondent filed or uh, respondent filed a response stating the complainant completed the property disclosure. Right, it should be seller. Sorry. And so that that was my question. Was that really stellar? Okay, and if that's stellar, then I'm fine with your uh, uh, decision to dismiss. So can I make that motion? I guess John to, to accept council's recommendation on number nine. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Franks. Let's vote. Uh, Chairman Green. Okay. Chairman Green. Yes. yes. Could I yes. say? Somebody's like washing dishes or in a kitchen or something. They need to mute their screens. I'm hearing a lot of backup noise. I can barely hear people speak. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Hi, right, Caitlin. Okay. Commissioner Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marsha Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffat. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. That motion passes eight zero. Bobby, number ten. Uh, number ten. My question was: I think the the, the 
proposal from council was to dismiss this and then open up another one. And I think the issue was, you know, that during their course of defending themselves on this issue, they basically incriminated themselves on the issue. And they were rebates back to people. And so we just go ahead and address it in this complaint rather than closing this one and open another one. So my recommendation was to close the complaint against the real estate firm because really the complaint is against the licensee. So I wanted to dismiss this against the firm and open it up against that particular licensee. I think a lot of times people file charges against a firm um, and not realizing, you know, that it would have been better to do it with a licensee. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm I'm fine with that. I, I I'm fine with okay. that doing that that okay. way. So, so I'd make the motion that we accept council's recommendation on this. Second. You ready for a roll call? I can't hear you, John. You're on mute. Can't hear you, John. You're on mute. Sorry, I'd like to try 10 and 11 together before we have a motion. Okay. And on number, right. no, on number 11, I'm going I want to see if I get the motion amended to add 11 to it. I really only want to know on 11 what a red envelope is. So from, I was not sure if this is the term that was used uh, in the profession, but when I um, did some research, it seems to me that it's just like an under the table type of deal um, where you're giving additional money to ensure that um, something happens and it's not technically a part of the contract or whatever the original deal is, but that does not appear to be um, what was going on in that situation. There was no um, evidence to support it. So it's just like an under the table type deal. So can I get the maker the motion to include 11? So it'd be 10 and 11 except council's recommendation. I'll, I'll amend my motion for that. It's Bobby. Marsha, you second. Would you do that? Yes. All right. Okay. okay. Commissioner Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marsha Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffat. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. Okay, number 12. That motion passes unanimously. Number 12. On number 12, I actually wanted to amend my recommendation. Um, initially, I was thinking that, um, that they weren't providing the lease agreements to um, the property management company. Um, but after going back and reading, it looks like they weren't giving the lease agreements to the owners of the properties to allow them to give to the property management company. So I wanted to amend my recommendation to um, give a civil penalty of $500 for failure to provide the owner of the property with the lease agreement after um, they requested it. So I, I agree with your interpretation, but I don't think I agree with 500 bucks. I mean, this is, why is there any leniency here? We've got a property manager who won't give his owners copies of leases. So the, I said 500 was because um, when I was looking at the information provided, it appeared that the property, the owner was changing property management firms. However, the change had not been implemented yet. Um, and at the time when the change was going to be implemented, those lease agreements would no longer be valid. 
um, they were, will have expired. So it wouldn't really um, be any use for for them to to have the the lease agreements um, since they've expired and they'll be creating their own. But they do have an obligation to provide the owner with the information regarding the leases as requested, um, even if it's going to be expired at the time that the new property manager takes over. The other thing is that this is a principal broker that should know what the the law mm -hmm. is about that. So if you guys would like to amend or change or make a new recommendation for how much civil penalty to issue, um, you can go ahead and um, make a motion on that. How many properties were there that were being, that we're talking about here? It didn't say how many. It didn't give me a specific amount or how many individuals were affected. <clears throat> but agreement is plural, so it's more yeah. than one. It's it's more than one based on yes, like you said, it it does have agreements, but they didn't say any um, specifically. What do you think, John? Well, it's pretty much a black and white issue. If a property manager won't give your copy the the leases so it sounds to me like we can get to at least two leases right well, mr chairman this is jeff yes jeff Kristen, does do we in your review of the contract does the contract require any disclosure of lease agreements whether they're going to expire or not um not that i saw but uh, let me go back in the file and just verify that. Did they use a, um, a, any a, a TAR form? Give me one second. <clears throat> So they did not attach copies of the lease agreements to this file. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. What is this? They have the property management agreement here. Um, and it does not say anything about um, what to do with the, the lease agreements um, when they expire. Um, and I don't have the lease agreements to confirm whether they were on a TAR form. Does your file have the contract from the current owner to the new owner? Does just the old. Any language in it? No, they just provided me with the old agreement. And um, the respondent attached a bunch of information from a few of the tenants to let them know where uh, the tenants stand in terms of their lease agreement and what their information is. Um, so how many it tenants? Doesn't have, mm -hmm. let's, it doesn't have all of the tenants on here, but let me see if I can figure out exactly how many they've listed. Let's see. It's hard to tell the way that they've listed it out. Um, I think what's so the here we go. Probably... Let's see, yeah, it's it's really difficult to to see who all. But from what I can tell, it looks like at least. Let's see. Eight. 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 Eight.
I can tell, it looks like they provided informa information on eight different tenants. It sounds like you're looking at the rent roll and not necessarily the lease agreements. Yeah, they don't have the lease agreements. It's just like they typed out a list of people um, with their inf like their phone number, how much their rent is and how um, like whether they're going month to month or a year on their lease agreements. Yeah, that's a so it's not the it's not the actual leases, though. On that property management agreement, does it reference any addresses? Or is it just um, a blanket agreement? It's just a blanket agreement. It doesn't have yeah. any of the addresses on it. So okay. this is not individual single family homes. Is this apartments? I believe they're um I don't I don't know if they're apartments. They could be like triplexes or duplexes. Uh, okay. But they're all on like the same street. So it, it could be a complex. It doesn't say complex, but the way that they're on the same street and have like um, different apartment letters, I would assume they're something similar to a town home or something. So eight off offenses we know. Yes. It's eight individuals who whose lease agreements they requested that they did not get. So, John, what do you want to do about your motion? Well, so I don't have a motion. I try not to make them. <laughs> <laughs> As a chair, I try not to make them, but I, I think the right multiple is eight times some number. Okay. Kristen, let me, let me ask you another, another question. Um, mm -hmm. So, statement you said that the new owner had not yet taken possession of the properties? Right. Well, no, oh. no, no, no. The new owner did. So, there's not, um, the new owner has possession. It was just the new property management company. So, they, they do have possession of the property. So the, so the just don't know what the lease language is. Yeah, so they wanted lease agreements. The respondents' position is that they don't want, they're going, first of all, the leases are going to expire. And then secondly, they don't want to provide their um, lease agreements because they're somehow specific to their firm, which I don't understand that but um yeah so that those were the reasons why they didn't feel that they had an obligation to provide the lease agreements so their their contention is that their lease agreement is proprietary and specific Basically. to their firm mm -hmm. so they're, they're not using standard tar forms then at that point that's um, what i would think but they did not attach them so i can't confirm that <clears throat> yeah, well, they gave they gave them to you their public record, so they wouldn't be proprietary at that point. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I've got a question. This is Steve. Go. Uh, is, is the respondent not giving a legal opinion? I don't understand how he knows or she knows that the lease is not valid. So they're going off of the duration of the lease agreements. Um, and the length of time that the property management company um, would be required to manage the property based on their contract. So they're looking at, at two different things and determining whether uh, these lease agreements or their obligation is valid in terms of providing the agreements to the owner. But I think they're just basing it off of the duration of the leases. Is, is what what they're saying basically then that the lease they don't have any leases then if they're not valid the leases there, there are none is that right so initially my thought was if the lease agreements aren't valid uh, or they've expired then why would they have any obligation to give it to um, the complainant um, when I thought the complainant was the property management company, have the complainant is the owner, and they do have a right to those leases um, and to know 
what the lease agreement said in terms of their tenants who they're now taking over. This is Bobby. How about I make a motion and we try to do something here? Okay. Uh, I think I think that the whole discussion is. Your document, and and everybody's got a different one. Everybody, because they have little charges and stuff that everybody does different. But but and so that's what they were trying to do. But they got to give a copy to the to the owner of the property. Uh, so my motion is that we'll take the five hundred dollars civil penalty uh, that council is recommending, recommending, but we multiply it times at least by eight because we know there's at least eight different properties we believe that they're handling. So that would be a total of $4,000. And so that would be my, uh, my motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Franks. Discussion. All right, let's vote. Caitlin. Okay. Commissioner Joe Begley. No. Okay, Commissioner Jeff Diaz. No. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffat. Aye. Commissioner Stacey Torbett. Commissioner Bobby Wood. <laughs> Commissioner Bobby Wood. G. Yes, yep, I heard you. Um, Chairman John Grease. Yes. It's, I, I didn't get Stacy. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. That would put it at five eyes, two no's, and one recusal. All right, the motion passes. Let's go five. So. Kristen, mm -hmm. we should handle this quickly. This is where a broker brought some customers into a house and left them in the house while they went somewhere else. So from how I understand it, they had an agreement for several different um, visits from these buyers throughout the process um, but prior to closing. Um, visits with their decorator, visits with contractors, um, just various visits. Um, and so the, that particular day, um, the buyers had already arrived prior to the respondent getting there. And when they, or I'm sorry, prior to the complainant getting there, the respondent was there with them. Um, and the respondent was under the impression that the seller, who's the complainant, was okay with them being in the home. So the respondent went uh, to a different I guess, property to turn on the lights, which was, I think, a block or so over, and came back. The seller was really upset that they left, but didn't, didn't really say that they were upset about it prior to um, the respondent leaving. So was there a written agreement? Um, from the complaint, I'm sorry, there, there was a written agreement. Um, let me see if they put it in here. So what I'm looking for, did the seller say it was okay for their home to be shown yes, um, that, without an yes. agent being present? Well, I don't know if that specific language was without an agent present was in the agreement, but That's they the did problem. agree. That's okay. the problem, letting somebody go in without an agent. 
Um, uh, but I, I'm almost wondering is if, if this might be something that should be more of an ethics complaint at a, uh, a real estate board other than something to come before. I agree uh, with yeah. you. I only reason I don't think this response will get um, anything that would rise to the level of a violation under the rules or statutes is that they had permission to bring the sellers in. They brought the sellers in um, and stayed until the, I'm sorry, the buyers in and stayed until the sellers arrived at the home. And um, I think just based on the, the reading of it, the seller was just extremely frustrated by the number of visits and did not really want to be there with the buyers um, sure. while they were doing all of that work to see what needed to be changed. Um, so it just seems more like, like you said, um, I share Frank's um, an ethical issue rather than something that falls under the rules or statutes. All right, the chair will entertain a motion to accept council's recommendation. This is Jeff, so moved. Thanks, Jeff. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Stacy. The motion on the floor is to accept council's recommendation for case number 25. Further discussion? Caitlin? Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley? Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz? Aye. Vice Chair Marsha Frank. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacey Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Next is number 30. Bobby. Yeah, this is my, my question. I, I thought this, uh, I mean, we've had something like this before where agents missed on uh, how big they said the lot was. In this case, we went from a 0.18 of an acre is what it uh, what it actually was, but they were advertising as at a 0.3 of an acre. And that's like a 40% difference in size of a lot. And I think that warrants a whole lot more than just a letter of warning. That was so, my thought. Um, Commissioner Wood, um, the reason I went with the letter of warning is that uh, it's because based on our prior uh, communications in terms of complaints like this, um, we have discussed a lot about the obligations and duties of licensees in terms of determining what the square footage is. Um, and they're not required to do a survey or anything. And this, I know there's some duty to go by the information that is um, available, which this licensee did. Um, they relied on the information provided to them by the builder and the seller. Um, and there weren't any records available because the community was newly established. So I just don't know what more um, the respondent could have done. While it does seem, you know, that this would be an obvious mistake if you were to maybe look at the land, I, I don't know. Um, but I don't think, based on our prior decision in situations like this, that we should assess a civil penalty if this person um, relied on the information that was available and, and had no way of getting any records um, from, from the records uh, department. To verify this, but all the, 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 ask for a plat. If it's new home construction, there has to be a plat, and most anybody would ask for a plat to see that lot. And it's just something in, on paper. And that and that plat is recorded at the courthouse, right? I mean, but the builder, you would think, would supply it to you. Yeah. If not, that would well, be a red flag. The respondent's um, argument is that the information just wasn't readily available because the community was so new, but I I don't know. Not true. Um, That's not a true statement. For there to be a community, there has to be a plan. 
Mar Marsh okay, is exactly so right. If it's a new property, then then there's definitely a survey there, and and that's what is is wrong. And uh, I can understand so if the property is 100 years old, but not brand new, not new. So, Bobby, Joe, how about a motion? Marsh. I'll make the motion of a a thousand dollar civil penalty and a. Uh, uh, course, yeah, and, and a four-hour course on contracts. The, the got to be done within 180 days. That does not count. To is there a second? second? Thank you, Marcia. I've got Bobby making a motion uh, for this license. He is thousand dollar civil penalty. And in addition to that, take a four-hour contracts course within 180 days, and that four-hour course does not count toward his required continuing education. That's the motion on the floor, properly seconded by Marsha Franks. Now discussion. Chairman Grace, I have a question. Okay. Um, this is Anna. What is the violation, the $1,000 civil penalty for? Just not Okay. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Bobby. Caitlin, let's vote. Okay. Commissioner Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. No. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Yes. The motion passes on a seven I one no vote. We're on to thirty one. Do you want to tell us what you like or dislike about this? Yes. Uh, let's, if, if I got this right, they put the property on as coming soon. And then there was an offer made on it before it actually went active. If I'm understanding this right. Where, okay. So, no, I don't. I don't think it was listed as coming soon. I think the property was just listed and it had the wrong amount on there um, because the I'm guessing there was some miscommunication between the respondent and the seller. Um, and it was a if typo. It, if, it's coming, the, if it's coming soon, if it's coming soon, that that would mean it's not on the market, wouldn't it? Because if it's on the market, why would you say coming soon? Um, let me pull up this file. And specifically, do they have a listing on the property? One second. <clears throat> this is, this is, while you're looking that up, let me tell you kind of my thinking. They, at least in our MLS, you can put a property, you could get a listing, you could put it on the MLS that's coming soon. And that's to tell agents it doesn't tell the public, but it tells agents, look, this is coming, but it's not ready yet, but it's coming. And, uh, and it looks like somebody, an agent saw that and they wrote an offer on it. And then as they were going through and maybe negotiating, that's when they realized that they had the wrong price on the coming soon. So because it's not an active listing, or because it's listed as coming soon and not an active listing, they are not required to have the correct listing amount for the property. No, did they, they, they a listing? I'm sorry, say that again. If they're advertising the property, they have to have a signed listing. Did they have a signed listing? Uh, I'm looking at the file now. Give me a second. Seeing the purchase and sale agreement. Um, let me see if they gave me the listing agreement. Sure. 
Um, I see a counter offer, well, an offer and a counter offer document. Um, let me check the respondents documents. Yeah, so there's an exclusive right to sale listing agreement here. And the listing agreement, I'm assuming you want to know what number is on there. Yes, because it was signed by the seller. Give me one second. <clears throat> okay, it's on here at 165,000. Um, so they put the listing up at 155, well, it should have been 165. They didn't activate the listing at 155. The way I'm reading this, they put it in the coming soon at the wrong I guess part. that's my question, Commissioner Wood. Um, does it, so your position is that because it's not an active listing, the listing listed is coming soon at 155, then it's not, um, they don't have to put, I'm not saying they don't have to put the correct amount, but it didn't count as a listing in the sense of an actual active listing. So the 155 um, is just a typo and not in advertisement because I know um, in the past we've had cases or complaints where there's a coming soon listing and if the information wasn't accurate on the coming soon listing it's been viewed as an advertisement and if the advertisement isn't correct then we've held them accountable so I just want to be sure that we're staying consistent and, and I want to make sure I'm understanding what, what your position is, Commissioner Wood. Yeah, I, I think you're kind of mixing different things and I'm only, I'm only looking at this particular one right here. If it's coming soon, it's not active on the market. So it doesn't have to comply with the advertisement rule then? Can I say something? Yes. This is Joe Begley. <clears throat> Seems like the first couple of sentences of this, I mean, we're, we're kind of arguing about something that doesn't matter on the advertising because they made an offer. The seller countered the offer. The buyer did not sign it before the seller removed that offer. So if they would have signed it in a timely fashion, it says here the second line, the offer was countered and signed by the seller for 155 with no seller paid concessions. So if the buyer would have accepted that, signed it right then, it's a bound deal. They did sign that immediately. They gave an opportunity for the seller to back out, which they did. So the rest of it's just kind of a mute point. Is that not right? I guess my, my thought is that whether it's a coming soon listing or an active, I'm sorry, whether it's coming soon or an active listing, um, I think both count as advertising. And I think you still have to have accurate information um, in both. So I guess my question is whether um, that is the case or not, because it is my opinion that whether it's an active listing or coming soon, um, the information has to be accurate. But I do understand um, the point that they had the opportunity to respond to the counter offer and did not, and they withdrew timely from the counter or from their initial counter, counter offer. So, as long as there's not a contract, you can yeah. withdraw an offer, change your listing price. And it, yeah, so. Right. Am I right or wrong? Or yeah, that's I right. think that's a good point. Yeah. It doesn't matter if they thought it was 155, and we've all had this happen. You listed at 155, the market's hot. Seller gets remorse thinking you've listed it too low. You try to talk them out of that, but they want to raise the price up after you've already, you know what I'm saying? Here's my thought on that. 
uh, as well, which is why I uh, recommended a letter of warning. Um, I think either way, whether they timely withdrew the counter offer or not, um, they need to be aware that of when they're or what they're putting on their site in terms of how much the home is going to sell for. And I get your point about, you know, maybe they changed their mind because the market was hot or whatever, but we want to make sure that that is the case. Um, and they withdrew because they decided they wanted to change the amount and not because they, there was an oversight of any kind. So I just thought a letter of warning um, would be beneficial in this scenario um, to make sure that the respondent knows to be vigilant in um, what they're posting and listing. My, and and I, I think we've got two different things that we're kind of talking about, the contract and advertising. And then I, I don't think the contract part we have, we have an issue with. You, Kristen, you're talking about the advertising. And then my question is, when are you responsible for advertising correctly? When the listing starts? Or before the listing starts. It's in my, my opinion that I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. And, and my, my point is I I don't think I don't think you're responsible for the advertising being right until the listing starts, until you can advertise it. And I uh, think you always have advertise a difference. it without a listing either though. Yeah. Well, I think you always have a duty to ever to follow the advertising rules, whether the listing's active or just the coming soon. And that's just based on um, our past conversations regarding coming soon advertisements. So my motion would be to dismiss is, is, is how I would look at it. Well, let's, let's get something to vote on. Is there a second to Bobby's, would, uh, Bobby's motion to dismiss? Eggly seconds that. Thank you, Joe. Discussion on the motion to dismiss. All right, if you're in favor of dismissing this complaint, when Caitlin calls your name, you'll vote aye. Marsha, did you say something? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Hi, right, Caitlin, let's call the roll. Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marsha Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. John Moffat. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. <clears throat> Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. Aye, Bobby, 32. Um, I think that the issue here was it had to do how you posted it or well, if, if the MLS was accurate or not. And my, my thought is this is really an MLS policing issue. It's not a real estate commission policing is issue. And so instead of a letter of instruction, I was just thinking to dismiss it. So, okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, just for clarity, um, the issue seemed to be that, that that with the listing, they didn't put it in pending status, um, which was kind of misleading to others. Um, so is that still an MLS issue if the status isn't changed to, I'm sorry, is that still just like a MLS policing issue if the status is not changed to pending and not it doesn't fall under an advertising issue where listings have to be kept current up under um, 1260.02. This this is where you don't want to go down this path is because most MLSs don't have a, just a pending. Like in Middle Tennessee, we have an under contract still showing, an under contract no longer showing. We have multiple, we have contingencies active, but still contingencies and I don't think as a real estate commission and then every MLS has got their own rules. That's why we don't need to be going down this path. I mean, because we can spend days on this. That's why the MLS is here. Okay, so I 
guess my question is, with whichever MLS you're using, um, do you not have an obligation to keep it current and make sure, you know, if it is in pending status, you put it in pending or whatever you call it, you know, whenever something changes on the property, I would think you have an obligation to make sure that you keep that listing current. Um, so is it, are you saying it's just based on the type of language, you know, that each MLS uses that makes you not want to present a letter of instruction? You, you do have an obligation to keep it correct, but that's the MLS that has the ability to police that. Unless Kristen can give us a law that says that. Well, I know under the advertising 1260.125C, um, it says that you're to keep listing info current. Um, and I would think this is the type of thing that would fall up under that rule. Well, based upon what you've given us so far, there's no way we can tell if it was done right or not. But the MLS would have that. That's why they need to handle it. Call for the vote. I, I, I'm sorry. What was that? There's a motion. Yeah. There's a motion on the floor made by Bobby Wood, second by Marsha Frank, that this case be. Uh, Ms. Frank's asked for a call for the vote. That's not debatable. Let's vote, Ms. Maxwell. Okay, Commissioner Joe Beckley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marsha Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwen. Aye. Commissioner John Moffat. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. 33. <clears throat> You, you, uh, as far as I can tell, you referenced two checks that were written out of an escrow account. Uh huh. But your recommendation is for $3,000. So is there a third check or is the math just wrong? Um, let me go and look here. Let me go and look in the file. Okay, so there are three different checks in the file. Um, one is uh, referencing a property, um, and that's the $2,790 check. Um, one is referencing petty cash, and the other is referencing petty cash. So it should be two checks, or I'm missing one check that I put in the complaint summary. So that's how I got to 3,000. It should be three checks. Okay, did you have any thought at all about maybe trying to revoke these guys' licenses or the broker's license for right money, commingling funds? Um, <laughs> 
the broker wasn't the one who who wrote it. It was the one of the. Well, hold on. Let me see. Regardless of who wrote it, the broker's responsible. Yeah, the broker's responsible, Kristen. Yeah. Well, okay. So I agree. The broker uh, does have some responsibility here. Um, but this individual who was writing the checks, um, it appears that he, this person was also somewhat of a bookkeeper. Um, and their position, the complainant's position is that, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm getting these mixed up because it's it's actually the complainant who did the stealing who's filing the complaint against the broker and the broker is responding saying that this complainant was the one who was stealing. I'm um, sorry, I got a little thrown off by this one. Um, but yeah, so... Um, so that's not in our legal report at all, what you just said. Hold on. I, I think I'm getting this one confused with another one. Give me one second to just look over the summary really quick. I'm sorry, y'all are right. So it is the complainant who's saying the respondent stole the money, but they have some other dispute and the complainant or the respondent is saying that they're filing this complaint um, based on a dispute they have in chance to record. Um, but yeah, so the complainant or respondent didn't provide any information that would make me any supporting evidence to believe that they didn't do this, but the complainant provided all this information to show that they actually did uh, mishandle the money. But you all are right. Uh, the principal broker does have some responsibility here um, and perhaps can open a complaint against the principal broker as well for failing this to- This is a complaint to, against the principal broker. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, John, are you thinking maybe this person needs to be downgraded from broker to affiliate? Because it looks like this person got replaced at that company. At the principal broker that oh, got fired. So, I just know in the past, this commission takes commingling or taking money out of escrow accounts for the wrong reasons pretty significantly. Um, $3,000 civil penalty, one thing, but I, you know, I, I don't know what the harm would be to suggest since this principal broker is no longer the principal broker of this firm that he'd be downgraded to an affiliate broker. I'll make that motion. $1,000 penalty for and downgrade the license to affiliate. And I'll second it. Okay, the motion, if passed, is to offer this license to the principal broker a $3,000 civil penalty, and he would also or she would agree to have his or her real estate license downgraded to affiliate broker status. That's the motion. Is there discussion? All right, if you're in favor of that motion, when Caitlin calls your name, you'll vote aye. Chairman Grease, I have a question. Sorry. Um, this is Anna. How long yes, are Anna. we going to uh, downgrade their license for? So forever. So that, that if they want to be a broker again, they'll have to re um, uh, educate and test. Okay, so they'll have to fulfill all of the requirements to be a broker again in the future. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Typically, typically somebody would have to be an affiliate for three years. Or be in the industry I, for three years. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that information was in the consent order, so it's clear um, when yes. they can. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, hey, Bun. Okay, Commissioner Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. 
Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Glenn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. All right, that number 33 passes unanimously. The, the motion now 36. <laughs> okay, uh, Kristen. There, there, there are a couple of things about this. First of all, it looks like foundation is against a principal broker when the complaints filed against an affiliate broker. I'm sorry. Partly, at least. What What did you just say? Is there's a you said a five hundred dollar civil penalty for failure to exercise reasonable skill and care. Uh-huh. I've got a, so I've got a bigger issue with this. It looks to me like this respondent is operating operating a property management company on his own. The principal broker said they have nothing to do with the rental agreement. The principal broker states on it rents long term rentals, but that is respondent's own personal business and has nothing to do with the firm. Mm -hmm. Well, I know at least in this particular complaint, he didn't own the property he was trying to put somebody into. Right. So my question is, shouldn't anything that he does, even if it is his own business, he can't, he can't operate as a property manager on his own without owning the property? Let me pull up this statute that I relied on. Give me a second. And John, while she's looking that up, so are you thinking he goes, ties up a property with long-term rental agreement, and then maybe he's short-term renting it out? I don't know what he's doing, but I don't. I think he's he's not buying the property. It looks like he's he's leasing the property from people who couldn't sell their home. Okay. And he's got tenants to put in there. Mm -hmm. I assume he's collecting the commission for doing that, but I don't know that. Mm -hmm. So the problem to me, the biggest thing is like you said, John, the principal brokers acting like they don't have anything to do with it. Um, so I see fault in both the and the principal broker here and, and, and needing to open a case against the principal broker. It was one thing if the principal broker didn't know they were doing this activity, but this one right. knows they are and allows it. Yep. With no oversight. They have nothing to do with it, it says. Yeah, so that, it is a, a problem supervisor. that they're not um, supervising or they're claiming to have no uh, nothing to do with the respondent and they aren't supervising uh, the respondent. So um, I don't think it would be inappropriate to open a complaint against that particular principal broker uh, who who filed this response on their behalf. Um, it would have been different if this person had their property management company, um, but they were uh, connected somehow to the real estate firm that they worked for, um, but they also are not um, providing any type of lease agreements to the individuals that they find to rent these homes, and um, they think it is okay to make verbal contracts for leases that are um, that they have active. So it's, it's a few issues here, wrong here, and we can definitely open a complaint against the principal broker for failure so to many, supervise. How many properties are we talking about? Just the one that I know of. They didn't okay. say that there were any others. Okay, I, I'll make a motion. I'd like to make a motion that we have a thousand dollar civil penalty for failure to exercise reasonable skill and care 
um, for failure to provide a contract for the rental property. And um, also um, require them additional education. <clears throat> Bobby, what would be a good course for them? Maybe a four hour contracts class. Okay. A four hours contract class and open a complaint against the principal broker for failure to supervise. Second. Second. Steve Gwynn. Thank you, Steve. Okay, you've heard the motion on the floor. It's a thousand dollar offer of a thousand dollar civil penalty to the affiliate broker and require a four hour contracts course with the normal parameters and excuse me, open up a um, administrative complaint against the principal broker for failure to supervise. Is there a discussion on the motion? All right, Caitlin. Okay. Commissioner Joe Beckley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. I'll come back to him. Vice Chair Marsha Franks. Hi. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Hi. Commissioner John Moffitt. Hi. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Hi. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Hi. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Hi. Chairman John Grease. Yes. Okay, that motion passed unanimously. Rhonda, three Bobby. Or was that you? That was you, Commissioner Wood. Huh. I have down John. Oh well, Anna. I guess maybe we got it mixed up. I guess it's Commissioner Grease then. Okay, well, I'll yeah, talk. I have, I have I'll John down. Yeah. Okay, I'll take it. So this um, this licensee admits that his customer or client went into a house and took an item out. As a matter of fact, it looks like the, the licensee said, sure, that shouldn't be any problem. Go ahead and take it. Yeah. That's pretty much the gist of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. So they, the oh, respondent God. was saying they thought the house was abandoned. It looked like nobody lived there and everything was trash. Um, there were garbage bags everywhere and they didn't think that any of it was belonged to anybody. So when their client asked if they could take this antique milk jug is how it's described, um, they were like, oh, shouldn't be a problem. Looks like trash. And then the um, their client started just taking all sorts of stuff. Um, and there was a camera, so they saw everything that was taken. This person, the respondent, paid or gave them some money back to replace some of the items that weren't salvageable um, and took responsibility for allowing them to take anything. So, yeah, strange scenario. It's not strange. It's stupid scenario. Yeah, I mean, it's I, criminal. <laughs> yeah, it's criminal for sure. So, at least from my perspective, I thought your, your recommendation of a civil penalty was low. I mean, that uh, he, this uh, licensee gave the respondent or gave the complaint fifty bucks, but that's that's not as less than. Okay, so we need a, a motion then, right, Chairman Grease? Yes, please. Yes, please. Okay, so I make a, rec uh, a recommendation uh, of a thousand dollar civil penalty for failure to exercise reasonable skill and care. And Bobby, is there any course you can think of? We, I always like to give education. Is there anything you can think of other than contracts this person could use, benefit I, I from? I don't even think that's. I mean, I. Make them read the Bible where thou thou shalt not school. <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's a great idea. But I, I, I don't know any PE class, so I, I think All the right. civil penalty. Okay. All right, I'll just keep it at the civil penalty then. 
Is there, is there a second of Ms. Frank's motion to offer a thousand dollars? I'm sorry, who said that? John Moffat said it. Okay. Let's vote. Caitlin, if you're, if you're in favor of thousand dollars, the penalty you'll vote aye. Commissioner Joe Begley? Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz? Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks? Aye. Commissioner Steve Glenn? Aye. Commissioner John Moffat? Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett? Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood? Aye. Chairman John Grease? Aye. Hi, Kristen. Does that take care of your load? Yes, it does. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. All right, Anna. Okay. All right. So I will go ahead and start reading the numbers in the record. The only ones I believe we have questions on are 80, 83, and 84. Um, so uh, number 44, 2019 095 45, 2019 51 50 63 69 76 2019-09871, 77-2019-09928, 78-2019-09984, 79-2019-10051, 80-2019-10831, 81-2020-0281, 82 20 20 84 30 1 83 20 20 6 4 7 1 84 20 20 0 7 7 9 1 okay um what, what do we take out of that 80 44 through 70 44 through 75, I have recommended um, dismissal, and for 76 through 84, I have recommended discipline. All right, so the, the, one, the ones that commissioners wanted to pull out were 80, 83, and 84, is that right? That's correct, and you'll recuse from 81. 
I don't want to recuse from 77, 77 also, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the chair will take a motion that would move to accept council's recommendation 44 through 84, with the exception of cases 80, 83, what, 81? 80, 81, 83, 84, that's right. 80, 83, and 84 we have to discuss. Is there such a motion? So move. Jeff, so Thank move. Is there a second? Thank you, Jeff. Jeff so second. motion on the floor is to approve council's recommendation on cases 44 through 84, with the exception of 80, 83, and 84. Are you ready to vote? Okay. Let's vote. Caitlin, please call the roll. Commissioner Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacey Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. I vote aye, but recuse myself on cases 77 and 81. And my name was not called, and I vote I'm sorry. aye. That's okay. I, knew I missed somebody. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> okay, that motion passes. Now we're on to case 80. So, Anna, no, this is a picture. Uh, okay, here's what here's what I think. This it looks to me like the respondent admits that he or she didn't read the contract, and it ended up costing the complaint a lot of money. The complaint also admits that they didn't read the contract. Is that pretty much it? Um. So yes, that's correct. They both they both admit it fault to both of the situation. So the respondent didn't read well and the complainant also did not read well. Well, here. so in my mind, it, it's a pet peeve of mine, but a real estate agent who presents an offer on a client's property and doesn't read the contract or the offer to purchase and not know, and know what to present to his, his or her client needs more than a better warning. It's just sloppy work. That's, I think. Reading the contract is the bare minimum that should have been done. I, don't, I will make the argument, I don't justify the argument, but pre-printed tar contracts cause people just to read what blanks are, they don't read the small print. I don't know if that was the case here at all, but this should be more than a letter of warning in, in my opinion. And the forms change, but that kind of language about uh, uh, pricing, I mean, that, I mean, that's one of the number one things they should be looking at. Uh, I make a motion that we uh, give this person a, a $500 civil penalty and a uh, four hour contract class. Second. Reasonable stone chair. Yes. Yes. Okay. Motion. Marsh is seconded by Bobby that this um, licensee be offered a $500 civil penalty and a four hour contract class to be completed within 180 days. Uh, discussion. All right, Caitlin, let's vote. If you're in favor of the motion, vote okay. aye. Commissioner Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marsha Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacey Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Aye. Okay. 83. 83 was me. Um, it was about the, uh, maybe the agent did a mail out. Did an agent did a mail out on a card 
And my question was, what exactly did the, did the agent say I sold this house or did he say this house was sold or can, can you tell me what the card kind of said? Okay, so the card says another home just sold in your neighborhood and then it has an asterisk sold for 10000 over list price in two days. And then it has the respondent's information saying your firm real estate specialist on the front and um, on the back it has, it looks like um, statistics regarding this agent um, selling, how the percentage, the number of homes they've sold and the list price, the above list price um, percentage that was sold. And I thought it was confusing because it doesn't state that they didn't sell this home. Um, and I thought that was potentially misleading and the respondent does, um, they also admitted that they believe that it possible, it was mis it could be misrepresentation based upon um, the advertisement. Hmm. But they, uh, see that was my concern. Uh, if they didn't say they, I sold, I mean, if, if somebody else sold it in your advertising, look what I did, that's improper, but or were they really just giving information that's public record? Or was it misleading and deceptive? I think, I mean, I think it's misleading regard. I, it might be information that is public record, but I don't think anybody that bought this um, particular advertisement would not know that this person didn't sell the home. But why is that illegal? Because it says so on their advertising. No, what did their advertising say that was illegal? So in advertising, it says that, um, hold on one second, let me pull up the specific rule. Um, it's on page 81 if y'all have your books. Right. So it says no licensee shall advertise in a false, misleading, or deceptive manner. And it also states that if you need, um, it requires, you cannot advertise another individual's property without written permission from the property owner. And that written authorization must be evidenced by a statement on the listing agreement. And none of that was this did not obtain the respondent did not obtain any permission but the intent of advertising is to sell that property he's not trying to sell that property it's already sold he's holding he's 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 advertising himself he's advertising himself i mean he's advertising himself saying look look i know what's going on out here i'm the neighborhood expert but I'm not convinced. Well, it, just has, done it. It, just, it just has the price of what was sold and the address. And it looks like, and then they provide their own statistics on the back. I think it's kind of confusing that it's not a property that they sold. That is my. It might be confusing. I'm not convinced it's illegal. Yeah, but it says misleading or deceptive. And we should side on the side of the the public and if the public's been harmed okay then my question is how did the public get harmed by him sending this card thinking that this guy sold a piece of uh property in their subdivision and maybe they should hire him to um to sell theirs when in fact um he did not <clears throat> i don't think that's harm either i think that in and out information about the neighborhood he's trying to get i mean he's advertising himself and giving out informational facts but i don't think you could say you were harmed by the card but that's my opinion Joe, and that's why we all get to have one <laughs> we don't always agree but that's okay so, Joe, yeah. you see council's recommendation 
My recommendation was a $500 civil penalty um, for misleading advertising, false misleading or deceptive manner. So, so Joe, what do you, you don't like that recommendation? Not if, I mean, not if we have all the facts that he didn't say he sold the house. He just said the house sold in your neighborhood, which is a true statement. Well, I'm, I'm not arguing, but what I'm trying to do is get to encourage you to make a, yep, yep, yep. Make a motion that reflects what you do like. Uh, a letter of warning, just make sure you um, watch your, dot your eyes and cross your T's on your advertising. Okay, there's a motion offered by Mr. Bagley that if I can get a second to, we'll offer this licensee a letter of warning. Is there a second? Jeff, I second. Is that Jeff? Yes, sir. Thank you, Jeff. So that motion is on the floor now. Discussion on the motion. Joe, why would you not just go ahead and dismiss it? I mean, if if we did, if he didn't do anything wrong, why do we need the warning? Because it was deceptive. Well, because <laughs> I think it was deceptive, but just telling him, you know, make sure it's not deceptive kind of deal. Just something to, you know, make him aware, like, hey, I'm on the radar is the only thing that I'm doing. If you just dismiss it. I mean, that means go ahead and do it again if you dismiss it. Yeah, I think it's just I'm on the radar. Somebody's watching me. So I think they just kind of walk a straighter line. Okay, other discussion. Okay. The motion on the floor is to send this licensee a letter of warning. If you're in favor of that, you'll vote yes. Why? If you're opposed, you'll vote no. Okay, okay Commissioner Joe Begley. Uh, Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Aye. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffat. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Yes. So the motion passes unanimously. Number 84. And if I pull this down to just about as simple as I can, it looks like we have a case of identity theft. What do you think? So, um, I, this is a one that I had, um, you know, great concern with. I wasn't exactly sure. So, what is happening here is the principal broker. Um, has been completing BPOs on behalf of their agents. Um, for this particular person, it was 40 different BPOs, um, but the principal broker is claiming that it, they signed an independent contractor agreement, which states that the firm owns all of the accounts or anything that results from it, and um, that they uh, Basically, anything that they complete is their own proprietary information. Um, my concern is that the principal broker or whoever in the firm is signing contracts in um, agents' names and um, then also they just they admit it to doing it and then they're claiming that this person doesn't have right to the information and then also that They've created, I believe, also an email account that this person doesn't have access to, and they're and the firm is the one that's receiving the compensation that technically the agent is doing, but they have not done. Um, so I thought at the very least that was a misrepresentation because the person doing the BPO is not the actual individual that's doing it, but I didn't know if this was also a common practice or not within uh, the industry? No, it's not a common practice. I didn't think so. It sounded mm -hmm. wrong, but uh, the respondent was just extremely forthcoming and 
admitted that yes, that they did this and they did not see that there is an issue with it. Um, so that was my concern. They they took the complaint and social security number without without any permission, without any disclosure. And the complainant is told he's done 40 broker price opinions when in fact you hadn't done any of them and not been compensated, but it looked like you might be going to receive a W-9 for it. It's, um, it's pretty blatant as far as I'm concerned. And they also created a fake resume. So, I mean, it, the, 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 I think the particular uh, conduct is egregious in this situation. Um, so I wasn't sure exactly where to go with this because I've never encountered something like this or even seen BPOs before. Um, so I am open to um, recommendations. I think that there should be, it is misrepresentation at the very least. Um, and so that's why I recommended a civil penalty and then two courses. <clears throat> but um, maybe something more needs to happen. And I can tell you on those BPOs, they're having to sign and attest to the fact that they personally went to see the property and that they did all the work themselves. And so they're lying on the BPOs too. They're forging it. I don't understand the end game. Why would you do this anyway? Just avoid taxes or you're banned from the BPO people? So the respondent stated that they did this as a way to get the agent's name out there in recognition purposes. So this was kind of like, I'm doing you this favor so you can get more business because you've done these BPOs. Um, but that doesn't seem like a legitimate excuse to me on any kind of circumstance for this. But that's the only reason that they gave it to me. Um, and then the firm is the person, is the one receiving the compensation for the work that the agent did. Uh, is the respondent the principal broker? Yes, um, the respondent is the principal broker. It says just real estate broker. Let me triple check. Sure? I'm pretty sure they're the PB of the firm, um, but let me look that up in core really quickly. You'll give me a second. Sure. Um, so it looks like. <sighs> If this person was originally licensed in 17, do they have enough time to be a broker? Um, I believe that it was reciprocity um, is how they became licensed as a broker. They're licensed in several other states. Um, I'm trying to pull up the firm right now because right now it says just broker, but I'm trying to see who the, the PB is. So yes, he's the principal broker of the firm. <clears throat> so John, if you don't make motions, what would you like to see happen? Well, this is, this is fraud at the very least, as Bobby points out to the, the company to be done for. 
<clears throat> Don't get the principal, bro. Yeah. Yeah. Makes you yeah. wonder if that's the person you want running that company. Maybe that person needs to be an affiliate again. I think so. Yeah, I think so too. It worries me about how many people they have under them. Or they may just be a one man, you know, person to show. So when at the firm relations on core, it looks like they're the only person with the firm. Um, at this time, the person that was there before no longer the complainant was affiliated, but they're no longer affiliated with the firm. So <clears throat> Do we want to downgrade and give a civil penalty? Yes. Bobby, you want to make that motion? Who was that that Joe just said that? Yes. That said yeah. I'll make a motion that we downgrade to a fifteen hundred and keep the thousand dollar civil penalty and the contract scores ethics. Is there a second? Second. Jeff. Thank you, Marsha. Discussion. Okay, we have a motion on the floor offered by Joe Bagley, seconded by Marsha Franks. That if it passes, would offer this licensee a civil penalty of $1,000 and a downgrade in his license status to affiliate broker. And we want to do as before to make sure that they have to fulfill requirements again if they want to become a principal broker. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I think he included in that four hour contract class also. Yes. Right, so contract and ethics yes. course. Uh, so we could give them contract yeah, and ethics. Uh, the only problem I have with ethics is we don't regulate ethics. No, and that's required. In, uh, it, he may not be a realtor, though, or she. Yep. So right, at the moment, I've got a okay, $1,000 civil penalty, downgrade to affiliate broker, four-hour contracts class. That's the motion, as I understand it. Is there discussion? Hi, right, Kate. Let's call. Caitlin. Oh, I'm sorry. I was on mute. I was on mute. Commissioner <laughs> Joe Begley. Aye. Commissioner Jeff Diaz. Vice Chair Marcia Franks. Aye. Commissioner Steve Gwynn. Aye. Commissioner John Moffitt. Aye. Commissioner Stacy Torbett. Aye. Commissioner Bobby Wood. Aye. Chairman John Grease. Yes. Okay. Anna has been unanimously. Anna, anything else for us? Um, no, I just wanted to let you guys know um, that, uh, as you know, the rulemaking hearings were canceled um, for today. Um, those will be rescheduled in the future. Um, I'm thinking that it's the, the earliest it can be is June. Um, so, and then also the, uh, the, the um, formal hearing that was scheduled today has been continued to June as well. Um, so that's all I have for me um, from legal. Thank you, Anna. Caitlin, anything else from you? And nothing else from me. All right. I'm going to just go around the horn here real quick. Stacy, anything you'd like to say on your way home? Um, no, nothing that I can think of. I'm happy that we have the opportunity to do these voice calls or these video calls. I'm glad I don't have a four hour drive. <laughs>
John Moffat. Well, I just hope everybody has a good rest of the week. This is, just sitting at home is boring. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Uh, Steve Gwynn. Yeah, uh, just a question about uh, the May 7th meeting, if it were to occur, is it, uh, are we going to come to Nashville the night before, is that off? And if that's the case, could we move the meeting time start maybe back an hour so we could drive uh, without having to get up as early? And then uh, I'd also ask or request that we, uh, go through lunch, but that we order lunch from some hurting r restaurant person. Who so maybe. Let me, the, I think um, well, the plan right now is Caitlin or Aaron has uh, got us home rooms for. Um, oh, okay. If you're not coming. So I think that's handled. Now, I'm not sure that we'll even be in Nashville in May. But that's, we, we're scheduled. We have a meeting room and we have hotel rooms. Um, okay. About right. ordering a lot of, excellent idea. Caitlin, can you think, look, think about that? Yes, yeah. I can think about that and I'll look into it. Anything else, Steve? Well, but you, yes. didn't, you didn't address the 9.30 late start so that people don't have... I think that's maybe a good discussion. It's not up to me because I don't travel further than Franklin, but it's what I'm hearing is Steve saying is is so he could drive up that morning from Memphis and have the meeting at 930 instead of 830. Is that right, Steve? Right, and it would save me from having to come over the night before. You're going to be in a hotel that's – I don't know if there's restaurants going to be open that night. Not yeah, that we'll have the end of the world, but, you know, and – I don't know so I'm how wild I am about going in a, in a hotel, but that's just me. Um, yeah. So I, I was just thinking it would simplify things. We can move it back an hour. Maybe we could drive. I mean, I could get up at 530 in the, or 5 or whatever, get over there, have our meeting, go through lunch, and drive back home and really do a one-day thing. That's my thought. If it's practical or not, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know what we can do. Both, we can have hotel rooms for those who yeah. want them the night before and start at nine thirty. There's no no problem there. All right. Okay. That's cool. Is well, that the, and, is and that I'll, okay? And, and I'll, I'll say it more impacts the East Tennessee people because that was the reason for having the meeting early so that when we get out that they could get home before too late. Yep. So really, it's an East Tennessee thing. What do y'all like? Because it doesn't impact me in Middle Tennessee. I'm okay with moving the meeting back if Steve wants to to do that. But if you change your mind, Steve, and decide that you aren't going to stay in the hotel, and I mean, this is all up in the air at this point. But if you know the meeting gets through um, in person, and we have hotels, and you change your mind, maybe just let them know a week or so in advance so we can go ahead and take the earlier time slot. But if um, I can understand, all right, okay, go in the hotel room. So it, is there any objection, and like Joe says, in the way up in the air, that our main meeting, which is a one-day meeting, start at 9.30 Central Standard Time? Okay. If not, let's just do that, Caitlin. Okay. Okay. And if we do move it up to 9.30, then we will schedule a lunch to deliver to us. I do that either way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Jeff, any comments? No, sir. That's it. Okay, Bobby. Uh, I, I think what we did to help out the real estate education today, it'll be interesting to see how that grabs hold. And I'm glad we were able to do that today because uh, that, that group is hurt. I mean, as far as providing education and, and agents needing an education. So I, I think that was a really good thing we did today. Thank you, Bobby. Marsha? 
Uh, just want to remind everybody to be safe and and uh, just keep doing what we're doing to, to be safe. And and uh, I agree with Bobby too about the education. That was really important that we do that. And I'm really seeing from all of this um, uh, terrible time that uh, we're all having to do Zoom meetings and different kinds of me meetings online. So it is showing us that we can do uh, business virtually. And I think that's something that we'll discuss in the future also. Thank you, John. Oh, I would like to add Happy Easter. Oh, yes, Everybody. yes. John, are you gone? It looks like John might have lost connection. Okay. John, are you there? John? Okay. okay. You're in I, th I think we're ready for to adjourn then. Is, is everybody in favor? Uh, yeah. All right. So long, everyone. Bye bye. Okay. Uh, bye. 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 B